So now I want to segue and talk about licensing patent rights. So can anyone maybe tell us about their experience licensing patents from an institution, whether that's you know an educational institution, a tech transfer office, or a corporate institution? Abish, I know you've gone through this before. Um, yeah, so it, we did have to back license my IP through our tech transfer office. Um, so that was a very interesting experience. It took a lot of time. Um, and my lawyers made sure that we went back because they're like, no, this term an investor won't like. We have yes, to that's the key. This yeah. term, you know, it's not something that with the funding rounds we, we're going for, you know, we have to change it. Or, you know, we need to be able to do collaborations with early customers so that they are our key opinion leaders. So we have to allow for us to, you know, place things with them and not, you know, expect revenue from these key opinion leaders. So there was a lot of information that was very crucial in structuring our, you know, license agreement. I would say it took us a good six months before we got everything properly in place that you know, we could agree with. And we knew that it wasn't going to hurt us. We went to talk to angels and VCs because um, if they didn't like our license agreement, we could have the greatest piece of patent, but it wasn't going to get us in it. Mm -hmm. So that was the second most important. And having people who had um, not only lawyers, but other people who had negotiated in licensing yeah. technologies from different institutions, Having them have an idea of like, oh, MIT asks for this, but Harvard asks for this. And I've seen this, but it's it's not really normal, but it could work in this situation. That was really crucial in, in having, you know, kind of pulling these people together in, in being able to do our negotiation for that you know, phase. So again, not a clear phase that we put into it, but it's very important. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I will. I'd say, <clears throat> just as we talked about the environment for entrepreneurship here, these tech transfer offices within this, you know, location and, and other places are very are very good actually. I mean, they're used to. Uh, I've actually, I sat on the MGH uh, side of the equation a while back, many years ago, where we looked at all the technology flowing from uh, through MGH as to what the what, what partners should actually patent, you know, what they were willing to, because they obviously have a limited budget, a lot of technology. They don't patent everything. They do start or do patent some things. But uh, when you leave this environment and go to smaller institutions, you really have to help them to, and, and most of them are quite receptive. I just acquired some intellectual property from a U southern university that um, was not very adept at doing this. Uh, they hadn't done this very often. They didn't really understand all the details. But carrying them through it and working with them and achieving the kinds of outcomes that Abish was talking about in terms of terms that allow you to finance appropriately, mm -hmm. um, is, this, is, this is crucial. But it, you're going to find a different experience if you leave you know, the, the sort of citadels of innovation like we're in right now. Right, right. And so are there any maybe key provisions in licensing agreements you think that need to be considered? Um, you know, a lot of them ask for a lump sum, a upfront stock provisions. Any thoughts on what to look out for or what picked your interest in that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we ended up uh, with quench of, you know, negotiating ours again with actually a European institution, which was, you know, is a big institution, but had not done a lot of spinning out of assets. They had done a lot of other types of deals with uh, big pharma and things. So it was, 
Yeah, really key there to have um, somebody on the BD side for us that understood things extremely well, almost a lawyer, but you know, really understood all these terms. As Abish is saying, it's just so much because you, most people are reasonable if you can explain to them why you don't want, like that's not a beneficial term for them mm -hmm. e either, really. They may think it is, but let us you know, play out some scenarios where investors, potentially someone buying the company, is gonna just you know choke on that maybe, right? And that could you know eliminate all the value of the company if the, if you keep that up and you know find ways to work around those things. Um, so you know it, I can just say again, it's it's incredibly important when you're doing those negotiations to have people who have a lot of experience so they can help walk others who aren't experienced if you're not working with local places who really do know things pretty well um, to kind of walk them through that and explain it all. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I mean, I'm a PhD biomedical engineer. I don't yeah. have any experience yeah. on what investors wanted. So in my case, um, even though I was the founder and I was on the IP, I could help a lot when we were you know, writing up the IP, but when it came to negotiations, I basically signed over the negotiation rights to my lawyer and to someone you know, who had a lot of business experience and who had done this multiple times before. So even though I was the one who finally signed on the line, they were the ones who could carry it out. So um, that was also something, you know, first time at rodeo, I didn't want to mess it up. But, my experience. So finding those people who will be very honest with you and tell mm -hmm. you, yes, fight this battle, or no, this is something that it's not that big of a deal. It would have been nice, yeah. but you know, we don't want to sour the whole agreement over or something like this. So that that was very key for me. You know, being new and in, into this whole negotiation. Yeah, and I can, I mean, I, one thing I will say on the finance side because I I put together an entire budget for our company. I know all the R&D space incredibly well. And one thing that I did not budget nearly enough money for were corporate lawyers. <laughs> Just to be really clear about that. <laughs> if, if you get, yeah, if you get into those negotiations, boy, that those bills add up really fast. And sometimes those deals don't come to fruition. Yeah. So it's money that yeah. you spend. However, you can often use that experience later on as you start to craft other deals. And I'll share with you that in crafting any kind of agreement, anticipating what may happen if there is additional invention or innovation that stems from what is jointly created, yeah. um, and spelling that out very clearly as to who owns what and how it's shared is really important because it can either stymie your um, working productivity together, meaning one side may hold back, and conversely, it could lead to a, a, a huge dispute later. It, which brings me to another point, which is in invention assignment agreements. Um, I was very careful very early on with those people who we work with, um, be it consultants, um, suppliers, anyone who's working on our project, to clearly have invention assignment yes. agreements in yes. place such that we are protecting our IP and no one can reach back to claiming something that is is ours. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. That's an excellent point. I think you're hearing about control, basically. Right. You know, you, you, uh, you need to be able to control the intellectual property, the assets that go with it, um, without um, that you, that's that that enables you to do things like sublicense, mm -hmm. like uh, let the uh, have an acquisition take place, etc., without uh, some impediment showing up. So I think mm -hmm. control, and then the cleaner the better. You know? yes. I mean, if you can, you know, everybody has some notion that you know the royalty rate down the road is going to pay for the next building on campus or something yeah. but it, it doesn't work that way usually so if you can get them to agree to this let's make it a very straightforward uh, arrangement and control is expensive so you may not be able to afford control because if you want to control it you have to be able to defend it and prosecute it so oftentimes the yeah. other do you think 
Well, I don't think, yes. I mean, I think on their side of the equation, they've got the right to demand that you, you know, exercise commercial reasonableness about, mm -hmm. about taking the assets forward. And that's a legitimate quid pro quo, I guess. Sure. Right? Yeah. But then also making sure that as a company, you can now go and make, um, you know, collaboration agreements. And exactly. That's that what I was. And then also, um, you know, buy out or if you make improvements, you know, where, where do they end and where do we independently begin? Mm -hmm. So those were, those were the ones we, we fought the hardest mm -hmm. on.